Uh, this is uh, Jerry Barra talking. Uh, today's date is uh, April 11th, 1986. Uh, I interviewed uh, Jack Hurst today. Uh, he is a uh, he is the senior vice president for uh, technical support services at Eastern Airlines. Um, he uh, stated a strong preference for not recording the interview on tape, and so uh, I am uh, going to make a record here of my recollection of our conversation. Although it was very free-flowing and I did not take notes, uh, I'm recording this uh, just uh, moments after the end of our interview, which lasted from about uh, around 11 o'clock, 11 a.m., until about uh, 20 minutes after 12. The latter part, of course, was taken up with just some uh, personal reflections uh, by both of us on uh, the world and our lives. Um, he uh, has uh, contact with uh, a number of the uh, smaller bargaining units uh, within Eastern Airlines, but also with the uh, with the large machinist contract, as it covers uh, service people in the various facilities um, around the Eastern properties. Uh, he had very uh, strong views about uh, uh, Charlie Bryant. He uh, feels that. The uh, guy uh, has been amazingly successful in bargaining because he is really unable to reach an agreement. He's unable to see where an agreement lies and to uh, make the necessary uh, compromises to, uh, to achieve agreement. Uh, he, in fact, said that uh, he didn't believe that Charlie had ever really reached an agreement any place, that instead he would prefer to say no, and given the uh, the style of uh, Eastern's negotiations, uh, he's been rewarded for saying no repeatedly. And uh, as long as the co he can threaten to strike, and management is unwilling to take a strike, uh, that style of bargaining, i.e., saying no. Uh, is rewarded and encouraged, and uh, that's been the story of their agreement, of, of their relationship. He has uh, actually negotiated with um, uh, Bryant uh, in at one form or another, usually in contract administration matters, uh, going back as early as 1971. Uh, Hearst came to uh, Eastern at about the same time that uh, Borman did, and he's known Borman uh, since they were both in the same company at uh, uh, West Point. Hearst said that the decision to uh, encourage a large number of foremen and middle managers to retire uh, a year or two ago as a result of an agreement with the machinists um, has been a disaster. The agreement was made because the machinists were pushing the idea of lead men taking more responsibility uh, for working with and leading their uh, fellow machinists. And uh, he's saying that this has not worked out very well because it's very hard for a fellow member of the bargaining unit to uh, exercise any reasonable discipline uh, over uh, fellow members. And so uh, in most cases it hasn't worked well, and what has really happened is the vast amount of experience in the foreman, uh, who are, after all, uh, master mechanics, masters of, of the area that they're supervising, uh, that has been lost and will be a long time before it's replaced. In the meantime, it's being, uh, the, the void is being filled in, in very incompletely by these lead men who are not really able to oversee 
and bring the necessary discipline into the into the workforce. Uh, Borman made reference to this uh, also uh, in my interview with him, and uh, seemed to feel that maybe they had gone, the management had gone too far in uh, eliminating uh, these supervisory positions. Um, Hearst uh, has the has a view that uh, it's extremely difficult to uh, exercise much leadership from a managerial point of view in a highly unionized sector like uh, that of the mechanics. And uh, he, uh, coming out of the military, he said he has a strong feeling about uh, the responsibilities of leadership and the qualities are necessary to do that. And he said it's extremely difficult to do that, even though he takes a strong managerial position, tells people what, what his view is, when he thinks they're right, when he thinks they're wrong, and he thinks he has more success approaching it that way than other people do. But it still is not that easy when you're dealing with an organized group of employees who work within a political organization, that is, the union. Um, he also suggested that one of the difficulties with the IAM is that the bulk of the people in uh, Local 100 are not the skilled mechanics. They're the unskilled or less skilled, semi-skilled uh, people who handle ramps and uh, baggage loading and unloading. And these people tend to be um, grossly overpaid. Um, in terms of uh, what they would be able to get outside of the airline industry for similar skills, whereas the machinists are uh, only slightly overplayed uh, using that kind of comparison. But the union has to be responsive to the majority of its workers, and these workers, the less skilled and the semi-skilled, uh, are the ones that have benefited most from the union uh, under Charlie Bryant and his refusal to accept uh, cutbacks and wage givebacks. And the fact is that the 20% uh, cut that uh, all the other three union, the other two unions took uh, back in February uh, uh, as a part of the agreement just prior to the sale to Texas Air, uh, the, the machinists still have not done that. And the uh, Eastern is in the process now of attempting to get into bargaining with them to uh, get an agreement on the 20 percent. But the union is saying, they ha the machinists are saying they have a, a closed contract that runs until 1987, and they don't need to discuss it. The Eastern is using the argument that when Charlie Bryan, on the eve of the sale, proposed a 20 percent reduction and the resignation of Borman, uh, he in effect opened the contract for negotiations and that constituted a notice under the National Mediation Board rules and the Railroad Labor Act and therefore they should get into bargaining. But in order to have that argument prevail, uh, Eastern is probably going to have to take the machinist uh, to court. Um, other employees that are in small bargaining units that report to uh, Hearst uh, include the, uh, the guards and the, uh, the uh, maintenance, the cleanup crews, in, uh, in the various buildings uh, owned by East, owned and operated by Eastern. And some of them are in bargaining units. Uh, and the re result is uh, they're, uh, in his view, greatly overpaid because in the unregulated industry, uh, their wages were pushed up and never have really come down very much. Um, but in newer facilities where they've been able to, to do this, they have contracted with uh, cleanup services and other services of that sort. 
And in most cases, these are unionized, uh, but the pay is considerably less than what's paid um, by Eastern to its own employees. For example, he talked about uh, uh, cleanup crews that they hire through another employer at uh, Kennedy uh, working uh, for uh, something around $5 an hour, whereas uh, their own cleanup crews, their own employees in Eastern, um, get more than twice that amount. Um, we talked about the, uh, the need for trust and the problems of establishing trust uh, with the workforce. And uh, he saw that as a very key thing. And he felt that the uh, uh, back down that was done, or the cave-in that was done by Eastern Management in the spring of 83, when they refused to take a strike by the machinists, um, was probably the most devastating mistake that was made um, by Eastern management. And he said he appreciates the reason why Eastern did not take the strike. That is, they could not afford to sustain a very long strike because of their cash on hand, but that not having taken it, they repeated a scenario that they had repeated many times before. And, but this time, because so much buildup had been done in, the, in getting the cooperation of the pilots, the flight attendants, and the non-contract employees, including many supervisors, um, built up an expectation that once and for all, Eastern was going to take, take on the machinists and, uh, and put them in their place, uh, make them behave like other Eastern employees. When this didn't happen, the uh, false expectations were dashed, and uh, many supervisors, Hirsch feels, have never really returned the same kind of loyalty that they once had uh, toward Eastern. And they probably never will. Um, Hearst saw that event in the spring of 83 as the beginning of the end as far as Eastern as an independent company. And it's really what led ultimately to the, to the sale of the company to Texas Air in uh, early 1986. And he said even that, unfortunately, has uh, convinced many of the machinists that uh, they still were on the right track because nothing bad has really happened to them. They didn't give up, they didn't give up the 20 percent. And uh, so now the company's been sold, uh, so what's different? And therefore they can uh, continue to choose to look at it as uh, a lot of hype on the part of Eastern management that, uh, that wasn't real. Hearst told me that his uh, impression of Charlie Bryant's ability in being a union spokesman to the public was just extraordinary. He said he, uh, he really comes across as being the underdog, being sincere, being well-informed, being uh, good-intentioned. He said it's, uh, this is this case so much so that when his, when his, Hearst's wife, um, sees Charlie on television presenting his side of some controversy, she will say to Hearst, how can you be so unreasonable? He certainly has made his case. And uh, Hearst said he has to admit, even though he, he personally is very biased uh, against Bryant, that Bryant does come across in the most positive kind of way, and that Eastern has never been able to counter that. Uh, Hearst said that uh, Bill Usry is the greatest negotiator he has ever seen. He said that it would have been impossible to get the various agreements they have since, 19, since the summer of 83 without Bill Usry. 
he said to a large extent he is should get full credit for that. On the other hand, he said uh, Frank Borman has very little patience and therefore cannot negotiate. And to the extent that Bill succeeded, it was because Frank backed off and let Bill do it, or was urged to back off by Bill, and gave Bill a free hand to work out some of these things without, in the, in the patient sort of way, uh, that that's such an agreement could be made. And uh, so it really is, a, as far as he was concerned, Frank's lack of, lack of patience, but his w willingness finally to give in to Bill working the thing through as the patient negotiator. Um, Hearst said that uh, Bob Callahan um, of the Flight Attendants Union is uh, credited with being a, an intellectual. And uh, what that really means is that uh, he uh, is a self-professed intellectual and refers to himself as a doctoral candidate. What that really means is he has one course, he's taken one course beyond a master's degree. Um, he felt that uh, Callahan, uh, from time to time in the board of directors meetings, would say on the few occasions when he did talk, he would say things that were really stupid, really dumb, really shown a great deal of ignorance. Um, I asked him about uh, trust and the need to build it and the difficulty of building it. And he said that he thought the thing that was most destructive of trust in the company was the corporation's tendency to make agreements with the unions that it was unable to keep. And this was particularly true of the agreement made in the spring of 83 with the machinists to avoid a strike. Uh, and once the agreement was done, uh, within days of that, uh, the company was back asking the union for concessions. And the concessions that they got at that point came at a high cost. And it basically destroyed trust, and it probably is the first time in his career at Eastern that Borman began to hit some sour notes with the, with the employees, with the bulk of the employees. Uh, I made a mistake earlier when I referred to a 20% cut that uh, Charlie Bryant offered on the eve of the sale of Eastern to uh, Texas Air. Uh, his offer was actually 15 percent and the resignation of uh, Borman as uh, chairman of the board. Hearst had uh, uh, quite a bit to say about um, the employee involvement program. Uh, he uh, personally participates in a, in a good portion of that because he has such a large number of employees that report to him that are, uh, that are land-based, uh, many at uh, the Miami headquarters. Uh, his complaint about it uh, is that the, uh, the process itself puts more emphasis on process than it does on content. And to illustrate that, uh, he gave me copies of uh, some recent minutes from a, uh, an employee involvement um, group meeting. And he said that this particular one is typical of it, that they, uh, they deal with a lot of things that have to do with uh, when is their next meeting, uh, who is responsible for preparation for the meeting, and a lot of uh, things that he referred to as uh, process as opposed to content. Uh, he said that very little, as near as he can tell, is done in these meetings that really deals with content, and he thinks uh, that's a big disappointment. Uh, he said maybe it's valuable for people to get together and talk, uh, but a lot of it 
uh, turns out to be a waste of time. He referred to an employee of his um, at the uh, computer center who is spending now nearly one half of his time on employee involvement. And he thinks the, uh, the result of that uh, is certainly not uh, commensurate with the, uh, the outcome from that is not commensurate with the, uh, the input of that many hours of this individual's time. And he's aware that a lot of other employees uh, are doing the same thing. Uh, Hearst also talked about um, the uh, the fact that the purport the large proportion of the machinist union bargaining unit uh, is not made up of skilled mechanics, and that from time to time the um, uh, the skilled mechanics talk about um, going it alone. That is to say, having a bargaining unit that is just representative of the skilled mechanics. Uh, the feeling apparently grows from the fact that uh, these other employees who are way overpaid uh, because they're attached to the uh, machinists uh, ride on the, the ride on the skilled on the coattails of the uh, of the more skilled workers. But he said uh, he he has always hoped that that would happen because he thought it would be uh, useful uh, to the. To the uh, to Eastern to have these two groups uh, separated, the less skilled from the very skilled, and he thought they could deal with them more effectively. He said recently there hasn't been much talk about this, but it's always been a hope of his that that would happen. Uh, this is the end of the notes on the conversation with uh, Jack Hurst, and the end of the table.